Uh, yeah, just to mention something that happened with face to face, but briefly was that uh, uh, we had a, what we call the media performance afterwards because people got outraged and uh, the thing went on in the media very very quickly. So we had a lot of media reacting, and we discovered that there was a, a phenomenon we weren't aware of, uh, which were the, the some fake blogs that just copy and paste. Uh, uh, other posts and use uh, dictionary for finding synonyms. So you can't say it's my post, uh, but they have plenty of them and they got indexed by Google and stuff like that. So just to say that you try to implement a mechanism and then you find out something else. I'm not going to talk about face to Facebook, even if uh, I, I would be happy to uh, talk about that privately, also because there are still some quite harsh legal questions open uh, with Facebook lawyers since uh, five years. Uh, what I'm going instead to talk about uh, is uh, the spaceless, spaceless book. I'm, I'm kind of uh, uh, curiously uh, uh, taking up uh, from where Amerik ended uh, somehow. We were joking about the fact that we belong more or less to those the same scenes and groups he was mentioning and uh, there are some, even if we haven't talked before preparing our respective talks, uh, there are some connecting points that we discovered. Uh, so we were talking about the fact that maybe in those groups we develop some kind of uh, um, instinctive uh, telepathy. But anyway, uh, I just wanted to uh, very quickly and shamelessly uh, uh, show uh, the magazine I'm editing uh, since uh, 23 years uh, called The Neural. This is the first issue in 1993, so I have a, also a publisher, so I have quite a strong, uh, not strong, but uh, constant practice about publishing. And this is the book that has been published in 2012 called Post Digital Print. Uh, the, the original English one is on the left, then there's the Italian translation, on the right there's a brand new French translation, which I likely presented just uh, yesterday night in Paris. But if you are curious about uh, uh, the book, you can just uh, freely download the English version going to the website postdigitalprint.org. There also, there's also other material. End of shameless promotion. And I'd like to start with this concept of the space uh, book. Uh, the concept of a publication is to include a limited amount of content in a manageable printed space. But as soon as humans have been accustomed to the dimension of the single publication, they have tried to overcome its limits and expand it, possibly including as much information as possible in a printed form. Multi-volume works and then encyclopedias have helped dividing what couldn't be bounded in a single still manageable printed space. But after the dematerialization of the same space, the boundaries had first been blurred and then just vanished, giving room to prototypes, visions and artworks. So I've tried to reconstruct a, a very partial and short the history of the infinite publication. The aim to have more space for content in publications arise during the 20th century as a consequence of a progressively more dynamic, global and information-based society. Breaking the boundaries of the print publications was something envisioned first by El Litsinski in 1926, first envisioning that, he said, the printed surface transcends space and time. The printed surface, the infinity of books, must be transcended. And he had this vision of the Electro Library. Transcending space could also mean not having to define in advance the size of a publication, remaining unknown unless it's printed, or the number of pages is displayed. That's more or less what is happening with ebooks right now. So the radio newspaper was tested in the second half of the 1930s and it was meant to allow a radio listener to print a daily newspaper at all, including pictures. 
It was transmitted through a dedicated radio frequency and then decoded and printed through a specific device integrated into the classic radio receiver of that time. Another famous conceptual attempt to overcome the print space has been written by Vannevar Bush in 1945, when he sketched what he called the Memex system, a kind of enhanced microfilm storage system for everybody, which should have, uh, been drastically, uh, should have drastically reduced space of publications, making them completely searchable. But before all of them, there was already a kind of fun inventor who had a different approach. Instead of creating a new medium, he wanted to minimize the space of print, which is quite similar to what a couple of decades later would have been done by microfilms. This guy, called the Rear Admiral Bradley Fiske, developed in 1922 the pocket reading machine. A small device allowing to print stuff in a very tiny paper space and then magnifying it in order to be read, collapsing the space of print and enhancing its portability. <laughs> and different uh, methodologies to reduce the space. Space, as you see, is a quite uh, substantial element in media in general, but in print specifically and include more content were quite popular in different methodologies to reduce space in, uh, sorry, uh, in both business to optimize the space of distribution and in education to relieve the students from the heavy textbooks. Particularly, the prototype of a kind of infinite uh, mechanic book has been realized by the Spanish teacher Angela Ruiz Robles in 1949. This looks like completely do-it-yourself stuff from the 40s, but it was brilliant. Her, her en sorry, Encyclopedia Mechanica was meant to connect spellers and drawings in a quite interactive way. And it also had a quite unique zoom function in order to let the students focus on a specific part of the course. A couple of decades later, these aspects were presented in the US in 1968 by Alan Kay, showed for the first time in his Dynabook prototype, never realized, but meant for also for educational purpose. But let's see, these were all um, prototypes that never become actual products, as you know. Uh, we don't have them around, none of them. But there's an imaginary which comes from uh, usually science fiction when you talk about media and possible media. So let's see how endless content, we can see about endless content through the science fiction lens. So beyond prototypes, uh, the most vivid and advanced imaginary about the infinite book has been historically carried mainly by science fiction writers who have provided different visions of a truly expanded publication. It's not literally considered science fiction, but the Library of Babel by Jorge Luis Borges, written in 1941, is probably the most famous example describing an infinite library with all the possible books that can be written. Just a few years later, Richard Shower, in his uh, I Remember Lemuria, published in 1944, wrote about an enigmatic object that he called a pocket reading machine. This is the quote from this short history. It looks like a pocket reading machine and it will not be noticed <coughs> with uh, suspicion. And only three years later, in 1951, Isaac Asimov, in his short story, The Fun They Had, imagined about so-called telebooks. In his story, a couple of kids living in 2157, so quite distant in the future, they, found, they find an old printed book from the previous century, stating at some point, uh, they said, what a waste. When you are through with the book, you just throw it away, I guess. 
Our television screen must have had a million books on it, and it's good for plenty more. I wouldn't throw it away. We can find some contemporary attitudes here, I would say. We have several other examples of partially electronic publications. As the rapidly evolving technology allowed the writers to imagine them, up to 1989, a few years before the internet would have completely changed the whole mediascape. In that year, science fiction writer Ben Bova, in his novel Cyberbooks, tells the story of a young programmer inventing an electronic book device. And how this device completely disrupts the New York Center, the publishing industry, and also even buyer. A quote from the book uh, is when the protagonist, uh, um, for the first time, takes this device. It said, from it he pulled a grey oblong box about five inches by nine and less than an inch thick. Its front wall was almost entirely a dark display screen. There was a row of fingertip sized touchpads beneath the screen. That was 1899. The e-books for this imaginary machine were delivered by cheap workers. But what the protagonist was passionately questioning was the potentially uncontainable nature of information. He says, I contend that publishers are in the information business, not the wood pulp and the chemical industry. What you want into the hands of your readers is information, which, which does not necessarily have to be in the form of ink marks on paper. This is the end of the quote. And this, is, this imagined prototype, boundless publication, are conceptually able to have all the knowledge in a single place, being both expanding and inclusive. Then let's have a look at artists endless publications. The third part that hopefully um, caused the, this um, media scenario. So when we look at the artist's use of publications uh, as artistic medium, there's a prime concept that rapidly emerged, which is thinking about uh, publications as archives. There was a question before about, uh, yeah, but the artist has always used publications. True. But in a quite different way, depending on when you look at them. So we have the avant-garde, for example, using publication in quite specific way in the early 20th century. If you go back, it's, they would sound quite cheesy now. Uh, a quite uh, a big turn, is in the 60s where when artists started to think about books not anymore as objects but as media. So publication is archives, so repository of elements collected, stored and preserved on the publications page. This concept has been, has been uh, announced by artists quite early. Already in 1963 one of the first acknowledged modern artist books 26 gasoline, gasoline stations by Eduard Ruscher was compiled as a collection of photographs of gasoline stations he encountered during his <coughs> recurring trips to visit his parents. The book is used as an archive, storing those pictures as an abstract and personal memory album. And numerous artists have used the same strategy over time, using the space of the pages to accumulate coherent content becoming then a self-inclusive archive. But in the current, I also want to use some post uh, word, so in the current post-digital dimension, the infinite number of online pictures represent a huge visual material for artists. So the concept of print publication as archive of the digital has been revamped and expanded among the many visual examples, 
you can find plenty of them. Artists just scraping images uh, with any kind of criteria and then having a, a print on demand book about them. And that's the artwork. But there are some, a few actually, which use a computational approach with no pictures. For some reason, they are more interesting for me. One of them is called Path. And it's made by artist Kate Armstrong. She printed a 12 volume artwork with text generated by the physical, <coughs> sorry, by the physical movement of an anonymous individual living in the city of Montreal between 2007 and 2000, 2005 and 2007. Each time this individual accessed the internet using public Wi Fi, over the course of this two-year period, he was tagged with a textual passage exploring themes of visual, personal and spatial patterns as reflected in the leaves of fictional characters. So basically she's using the movement of this person and the contact he established with the internet to grab, to scrape um, pieces of literature from plenty of possible novels and books, and then compiling a kind of disrupted story automatically based on the movement of this person in the city. Using, in a way, archiving both the movements on one side and the scraping on the other. Using book as archives can be more ambitious than just a limited edition printed repository. Even more, a single book can easily upscale to candidate as a time capsule. That's exactly what La Société Anonyme, oh, sorry. Uh, an international artist collective, uh, Aymeric was a uh, uh, very active part of it, uh, uh, did with their The Score Codex, whose content uh, text, pictures and sounds, was completely binary encoded, as you can see. So not really readable by a human. But there were enclosed visual instructions, you can see them in the background, about how to decode the same book. So it, it was meant to be preserved for the future in a classic time capsule strategy. The computational not always generative part, makes the digital books potentially infinite. Let's take a classic and current example. The literary Twitter bots. They use code to produce tweets, which can be trusted as written by a human being, possibly passing any Turing test, and sometimes becoming relatively popular in a potentially endless production that can't fit a classic publication but more often than not is inspired by some text from the past. One of the most elaborated and effective of these bots is a reanimator by artist Brandon Howell. He has a scripted Twitter bot called Herbert West that creates perverted retweets by analyzing the grammar and replacing selected words with grammatically similar choices from a database called, from the H.P. Lovecraft story, Herbert West Reanimator. And we should also wonder, what about the classic e-books? As said in the beginning, we can't perceive their size at a glance. This is a, a big thing, actually, which happens with the whole digital world. The concept of space, which is completely re rewritten for us. We can't cope with digital space because all of our, our um, categories, the senses, are completely tricked because we are always to refer to a B dimensional screen. So, even with the most simple example, a book, when we have an e book, we, we don't know how thick it is. And thick is, can't, it's not a category that can be applied to a, an, a, an e-book as well. So we can't perceive their size at a glance, as they only appear as icons or one page at a time on the screen. 
We only know the figure representing the number of pages, which, once more, can be almost potentially endless. Uh, sorry, limitless. Or anyway, completely overcoming any printed publication size. So, corrupting the e-books, almost literally, possibly creating new damaged versions of the same book, can potentially increase the already enormous number of them, challenging their own nature. Because the main concept we have about digital material is that it's infinitely replicable, and every time we replicate it, it's always the same thing. But Benjamin Golan, French artist, is an artist who often engages in his practice with the metaphorical and aesthetic malfunction of technologies, either accidental or deliberate. So stemming from some of his previous works, he created this Kindle grip glitcher, or he renamed it as corrupt.epub, purposely partially damaged ebooks. It's an online tool allowing anybody to upload their own ebooks and having them uh, then a shared visually damaged copy. Kind of suicidal practice for your own ebooks. The type of information which is randomly and not entirely destroyed is a specific one. It's a flowing text which can be changed in size anytime. And what is then destroyed is one of the content possible renderings, not really universal in its form as a printed page, but ultimately becoming similarly unchangeable. And then the striking Borges vision of the Library of Babel has been presented in artist production. Artist Philip Adrian, for example, has compiled his An Index of Five. I don't know if you are familiar with this uh, Library of Babel novel by Borges. He imagines this infinite library, where there are all the possible books that can be written. But uh, the, the, the volumes look like exactly the same. And the only thing you find on each volume is a combination of uh, six letters. So it's not really obscure, looking at the books, but you know that all the knowledge is there, behind these codes. That's a paradox that he uses quite intensively uh, in, in the 40s already. And uh, what Philip Adrian did, he did the index of the Library of Babel, which would have been simple. He just print the book, two volumes actually, with all the possible permutations of five letters, claiming then to have printed the Library of Babel index as the first five letters of any printed book should be there somewhere. And Borges is then closer than ever with the Print Wikipedia, an art project by Michel Mandibert. He printed 106 of the more than 7,000 volumes of Wikipedia as it existed on April 7, 2015. And also included, as you can see, behind a wallpaper, displaying the remaining uh, almost 2,000 additional volumes. There was also a 36-volume index of all the 7.5 million contributors to Wikipedia. And the table of contents takes up 91 700 pages volumes. The printed volume only includes text of the articles. Images and references are not included. And here we have a, a very nice way of dealing with the explosive digital space that we don't perceive when we scale it all of a sudden in a physical, real way. Finally, using uh, print as an ultimate archive of content frozen in time, can result as ironically extreme when we deal with the same content in a digital format. And the example is the artist Jesse England's ebook backup, applying it literally. What he's doing is reversing the usual backup strategy. In an artist book containing the whole text of George Orwell's 1984, whose every page hosts a photocopied picture of the 
the same page displayed on an Amazon Kindle. But he is referring to a specific, uh, not well-known episode in uh, 2009, the so-called, uh, uh, it was a controversial incident. In 2009, Kindle users found their copy, paradoxically, of George Orwell's 1984 and Animal Farm, which had been removed from their Kindles without their prior knowledge or consent. Actually, what happened was that the publisher was proven not having the rights to publish it, and Amazon was able to remove it from every single Kindle. I mean, not everybody is aware that their Kindles are not their private owned space, but they are constantly communicating with Amazon on a very, in a very different way, and that Amazon can directly access all the content that you have on the Kindles. So, even if it sounds quite, um, so, uh, uh, yeah, quite ironic, uh, even funny, it's referring to a, 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 an incident that would have been prevented if somebody would have printed out, actually, all the content page by page. Okay. The aim to have, uh, I'm coming quickly to my conclusion, so the aim to have an infinite book is more vivid than ever. Even if it seems more connected to a selfish human ambition than a real need of communication, of, com of communication or archiving. On one side, we consider the web as an, if we consider the web as an hypertext, we can conceive it as an almost infinite book. But we attribute to books the qualities of highly sophisticated content and consistency, while the web and the digital in general are about the instant, endless production and consumption. So, an infinite digital book is not there yet, but always quite close. Trying to overcome our own structure, organic limits, is something that we are recurringly embodying and we will continue to, especially if we will be able to finally reach an overall approach to critical perceptual publishing, finally including programming code and networks in publications. Thank you very much. Actually, the, the, the main problem with these topics is to trying to uh, define them as much as possible and not stepping into other territories. So Ted Nelson project, uh, uh, it's conceptually about the library, but then practically directly steps uh, into what the web became somehow. So if we can... Uh, I mean, I try to stick as much as possible with the publication as a constant reference. If we switch from a publication to a, 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 no, a, a, a random amount of information, then it's almost everything. Obviously, it could have been included, but then we would have talked, I mean, then we are talking about more information. Than publication. Publication is finite, by definition. You have a publication when you have a certain amount uh, within certain limits. They can be thousands, uh, millions, but they are finite. Uh, the, the main concept of the web starts to have uh, to overcome this limit, to not thinking anymore about a 
finite amount of information, but to have connections, I mean, relationship um, um, between, among different type of information that can be so upscaled to be perceived as infinite. I mean, if you think for a moment about the amount of uh, information that is hosted on the internet service, uh, I mean, you can't figure it out. Yeah, okay. Let, 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 let's try to, 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 uh, to put some categories, so maybe it's, it, it's, uh, uh, it's clearer. So, let, we start with the publication as an object, let's say. So, that's a, what, what we know it is. Uh, I think that at some point we started to think, okay, how we can break the boundaries of the publication, which was 20th century. And then you start to think about having upscale ones, possibly huge, big, and ideally infinite. But you still think about publications, so you still think about coherent amount of information altogether. A library, I, I, I never mind, I, uh, in the talk I never mentioned libraries. I talked about encyclopedias, and encyclopedias are the first attempt to have an only comprehensive publication. But it's still a publication, it can be 100 volumes, but it's still a publication. When you step into libraries, then it takes a matter of seconds to step to the web and to Nelson and what you're mentioning. But I didn't mention libraries, because libraries are ethereal type of publications, and then you have I mean, the only way I mentioned it was, uh, uh, no, I have to correct myself. I mentioned them for, um, for um, Borges' example. But it's, it's, a, it's a particular one, because the, uh, a, the very different type of content that you can find in a library, it's hidden in the Library of Babel. You never see it. You only see labels because basically this is my uh, hypothesis. One of the strongest points of Borges there was to confront us with the space of knowledge and our own space. So it never talks about something specific in the knowledge inside. He always mention the structure, the rooms interconnected, and these abstract names out of it. So except for it, I try to stay as much as possible off the library, because that is a different territory somehow. Well, thanks for trying to explain. Yeah. <laughs>